I'm Fran Burwell, Distinguished Fellow at the Atlantic Council, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this session of the EU-US Future Forum, Shaping a Transatlantic Digital Policy Agenda. As we've just heard in the previous panel, digital technology has certainly had an enormous impact on our politics and our societies on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, but it has also had an enormous economic impact and as we rebuild the transatlantic partnership, we cannot ignore the role of technology and digital policy, something that has brought almost $300 billion into the US and European economy just in the last year. And that's a number that keeps rising every year. Um, let me say though that this is not an easy area of transatlantic cooperation. We have long seen challenges uh, misunderstandings and conflicts uh, over uh, issues such as privacy, going all the way back to passenger name records in uh, following 2001. Uh, and now, most recently, last year's uh, ECJ decision, Schrems II, on the invalidating privacy shield. Uh, we have also seen issues related to digital taxation and to how we ensure that digital markets are competitive. Today, we have a significant wave of EU legislation coming down the pike uh, and a new US administration that is trying to figure out what its policy is on digital and tech. The EU has also proposed some cooperation on tech issues in their EU-US agenda for global change. To talk about this uh, area of increasing importance in the transatlantic relationship, we have three excellent panelists here. Um, first, we have uh, Asherina Amanate, who is the Minister of Economy and Innovation uh, of Lithuania. She is also the founder and chair of the Lithuanian Liberal Party, which is part of the current governing coalition. We have Eva Medel, who is a member of the European Parliament, representing Bulgaria and the European People's Party group. Uh, she is a member of the very important uh, Internal Market and Consumer Affairs Committee, as well as the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, also uh, key to this discussion, and on the delegations to both China and the United States. She was the EPP's rapporteur on the EU's digital strategy and is their coordinator for uh, artificial intelligence and the new legislation that has just been released on that. And last but certainly not least, uh, Tyson Barker, head of the Tech and Global Affairs Program at the German Council on Foreign Relations. He uh, worked from, has worked for many years at the Aspen Institute on similar tech, uh, tech challenges from Berlin. And he was a senior advisor in the Obama State Department. Let me turn now to uh, Minister Amanate and start with you and ask you, as Minister of the Economy, when you look forward now to our post-COVID economic recovery, what are the key elements of the EU's digital agenda that are important for that economy? And as you look at that, are there things that you would pick out particularly as a place where you think the EU and the United States can cooperate uh, digitally on digital issues as we both struggle with our post-COVID economic recoveries? Minister, over to you. Well, uh, hello, everybody. Um, first of all, I think there are two quite significant things we have learned during this pandemic. First is that global economy is already based on digital solutions and online cooperation. Second is that uh, the whole education system may be provided online and already went digital. So I think these two quite fundamental things well, we have to keep them in mind. Now, when it comes to transatlantic cooperation, I think there are three pillars we could base our partnership on. It's uh, first, uh, it's tech governance. And I'm proud that countries like my country, Lithuania, uh, actually are equal uh, partners with the US. Uh, Lithuania is number one in the EU by um, the number of licensed uh, fintech companies, and uh, we have been ranked the, the fourth best location globally for developing fintechs after the US, UK, and Singapore. 
Uh, we are also developing GovTech uh, solutions uh, that create an innovative ecosystem which connects uh, the public sector with small, medium enterprises, startups, and the academic community and serves as an accelerator for digital transformation in public sector. So this is, I think, uh, is, well, it's quite important. Now, when it comes to connect connectivity, still there are so many things we have to invest in uh, when it comes to infrastructure. On taxation, uh, we are committed uh, to agreeing structural and long-term global solutions to the questions of taxing digital services. And uh, we hope uh, this could be solved within uh, OECD. So generally speaking, EU and US, we are allies. And most important is not to have unilateral decision in neither of fields, uh, digital tax or digital rules. Uh, we have to work together. Thank you very much. Let me turn now to Eva Nadell. Uh, Eva, um, let me ask you the same type of question. If sitting there from the parliament, what do you see as the most important areas where the US and the EU should work together on tech? Let me also bring in the minister's last comment, which is about the US and the EU not doing anything unilaterally, but instead working together. And yet the parliament is now working on uh, a number of bills that have been submitted by the commission. I only have to mention Digital Governance Act, Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act, and most recently the AI portfolio. Um, is that unilateral? The EU is going to go ahead and, uh, or will there be enough time for the United States to weigh in on some of these legislative proposals? So where do you see us cooperating on these proposals? Thank you, Fran, and good to see you. Thank you for having me today. Um, in brief, on your first questions, um, uh, which are the most important areas? I would probably uh, answer um, concretely because we are working on a couple of files, as you've mentioned. Um, and I think also these areas of these three files are, are extremely important. So my first point would be related to cybersecurity. Very simple why. Um, nothing uh, of this digital revolution will help if our data, if our infrastructure, if our processes are not safe and they're not secure. If also we don't gain the trust of citizens uh, with their data and with their information. Of course, here we are not speaking just about data um, and security of, of, of personal privacy. So we have to try and work to have a common approach because as we speak, we are currently reviewing the cybersecurity directive uh, in the European Parliament. My second point will be related to data sharing and flows. Um, in Europe, we work on establishing a common government system for data. This is, in a way, our way to smarten up the way we handle data. But while in the same time, um, we want to uh, try and make companies, European companies, more competitive globally. Um, but when we speak about data flows, I think we need to be true to ourselves and know that nothing of this and no sort of innovation could happen in a vacuum. Hence, we again need partnership. And thirdly, as you mentioned, um, so to say we have a fresh from the oven, uh, so to speak, proposal for AI regulation. So that would be my third point. Um, we want to establish principles and uh, values for, um, 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 for AI uh, to, to thrive. Um, also, while taking into account uh, certain risks um, in, in the way AI is, is being used. Um, so I'm certain that from both sides of the Atlantic, uh, there is a strong will to make sure that digital technologies deliver for people uh, for a more equitable uh, recovery. If we want to do that, uh, I think we need to make sure uh, that we uh, indeed work with our like-minded partners, speaking of the EU and the US, of course. Democracies have to work together to preserve those shared values when 
uh, it comes to regulating uh, the future digital uh, world. And if you want later, we could perhaps discuss how feasible that is. But I think with this, just these three points, I illustrated how necessary it is for the time being. Thank you very much. Let me turn to Tyson, uh, who, although American, is sitting in Berlin and has been there for a while. So he has spent his time, I know, translating the United States for Germans and vice versa. <laughs> um, Tyson, what would you put on the agenda in terms of um, the immediate things that the US and the EU should talk about in terms of, of tech and digital policy? And I mentioned a number of disagreements at the beginning, privacy shield, digital tax, et cetera, competition policy. How do you see, why do you think that this happens between the US and, and the EU, who are, as Eva points out, for the most part, like-minded partners? Yeah, uh, well, thanks so much for the question. And let me start with a kind of core value on both sides of the Atlantic, which I think are very similar on each side of the Atlantic, but leads to some differences. So if you look at the United States, when I look at the way we use personal data or we, the way we handle privacy, I think that a lot of it relates to this idea of the pursuit of happiness, optimization, individuation. It's, um, it's an idea of self-actualization. I mean, even to the idea of targeted advertising. Well, why wouldn't you want targeted advertising? You're getting more, for, more bang for your, your data buck, your digital buck, so to say. On the European side of the Atlantic, the idea of data protection and privacy is based in the Kantian notion somewhat of, of human dignity. It's in the first uh, article of the German constitution, human dignity is unassailable. It's in articles four and five of the uh, European Charter on Fundamental Rights. And the entire tradition around GDPR tracing back to the 80s is based on this idea of human dignity, human centric ideas of how data relates to the individual. Both of these ideas are based in the enlightenment. Both of these ideas are democratic. Both of these ideas of basically our digital conceptions are based on the individual, but it does lead to shades of difference. And I think some of those shades of difference we see, for example, in the, the conflict right now over privacy shield uh, and the interpretation of it. And I think we have a long agenda, we can talk about it in this round, but privacy shield and getting this right is essentially the gateway to a constructive transatlantic digital relationship uh, in the near term. Uh, because as we all know, the urgency is quite high. Um, the expectation is that the remaining, let's say, passport for transferring data across the Atlantic is under, under strain and could uh, be removed as early as the summer. Um, and for the European Court of Justice, the question is this impossible triangle that Privacy Shield uh, basically represents. Namely, you cannot have the free flow of personal data from Europe to the United States, the uh, blanket bulk collection of data by US intelligence agencies, and the preservation of European fundamental rights as the European Court of Justice interprets them all at the same time. You can have two of the three, but you can't have all three. And so I would say getting past this stumbling block, and I think that there's going to be a near-term solution and a long-term solution is key. Once we get past that, there's a lot of positive agenda. And I would love to talk about it in the future. We can talk about industrial policy, market access, standard setting, connectivity agenda in the global south, particularly secure connectivity on land, sea, air, and space. And, and finally, digital rights generally, because I know that's a priority of the Portuguese presidency. But getting privacy shield right is, is first. So let me ask um, the minister about Privacy Shield, and I should say actually the larger question of privacy, as Tyson has put it on the table. Um, we clearly have some distinctions, uh, but I think there are some distinctions within Europe, and I wondered if you agreed with his characterization. Do you see everything kind of hinging on whether we can get an agreement on Privacy Shield? And go ahead, please, Minister. Well. Obviously, um, we have common values such as uh, freedom of speech, uh, human dignity, market economy, privacy as well. And uh, uh, again, both the EU and US, we have to base uh, our policies on common approach because 
there is a different, uh, quite the opposite position uh, in the global arena as well. And I'm talking about Chinese position regarding privacy, surveillance, freedom of speech, and so on and so forth. So basically the US and EU, we need to work together for digital innovations while setting global norms and standards. And we have to be first in setting them because then some non-democratic uh, countries that are also innovative at the same time, they will create those standards. Let me ask, uh, let me follow up with the minister on another area where there's been a lot of, I would say, difference between the US or a different approach between the US and the EU. And that's on innovation versus regulation. And it seems to me that Lithuania and the Baltic countries have a slightly different take on this than some of the other EU member states. Um, we often in the United States see regulation as the counter to innovation. If you regulate too much, you won't have innovation. Um, how, how do you see that? Because you have stressed in your opening remarks the importance of innovation and of, uh, and of education and moving the digital agenda forward. At the same time, we have a lot of regulation coming from Brussels. And I'm gonna come to Eva after you with basically the same question. Uh, well, I think this is this is quite an important angle you um, you uh, mentioned because um, for Lithuania, well, being a small three million population, we have to be faster, quicker, and more flexible in order, you know, to compete in the global economy. And I think that fintech uh, sector is quite a good example because uh, the Bank of Lithuania, the central bank, well, they are quite um, flexible and uh, the fastest in the, EU, the EU when it comes to regulating these new, very innovative banking services, e-money services, and so on and so forth. So as, a, as a, the EU and uh, the EU, US and our partnership, we have to keep in mind that innovation may struggle uh, when it comes, uh, when it encounters regulation. And our regulatory policies they have to accelerate change and innovation and not to, you know, uh, kill it. This is quite an important thing. And I think that this is quite important for policymakers and decision makers, politicians to strive this change because uh, best ideas may be killed by uh, the machine of bureaucracy. So uh, Eva, if I can turn to you. I think that what the minister just said in terms of regulatory policies must accelerate innovation and acceptance. Um, how do you, how would you apply that to the AI regulation, for example, and to Digital Services Act and the other acts that we're seeing now? Uh, is there a risk of inhibiting innovation or is this the driver of innovation in a European view? <laughs> Um, thank you for that question. It's an excellent question and it kind of uh, falls into what I really stand for. So um, I always approach uh, policy making within the European Parliament with saying, if we have to regulate, we need to ensure that we will not stifle innovation. Kind of my principle is regulation for innovation. Um, and. Uh, now what we are seeing, particularly with the AI proposal, there has been requests uh, that this AI regulation comes already uh, on the table a few years ago. Uh, I'm glad it arrives now uh, and not earlier because it had to be well thought through. Uh, and because, for example, we have a proposal in there where we are intending to have regulatory sandboxes that will I believe help innovation tribe will help startups to test their ideas, um, their concepts and, and so on and so forth. Um, but of course, it's something to always uh, to keep in mind. Um, this particular uh, regulation has been met with different feelings and reactions. Um, stakeholders think the regulation could increase bureaucracy, some of them, others, um, 
believe it could be costly for the business. On the other hand, other European developments, for example, say need to, that they need to pave the world, uh, uh, to pave uh, with concrete legislation into the world and be at the forefront uh, as Europe. So in European mindset and in policy making, I hope that our desire to always set the regulatory agenda, however, sometimes it is indeed very necessary, will not overcome our ability to foster innovation in Europe. I say that and I often give an example, uh, which is uh, when you have a game, it is not the referee that wins the game, it is the players that win the game. So while we strive to be uh, the referees, we should in the same time make sure that we invest enough into the players so that we could be competitive enough and be able uh, to be at the forefront of innovation. Uh, it's very difficult, but I have to admit there is a trend of putting a lot of regulation right now on the table, especially when it comes to tech companies. Uh, and it would be very important to find the right balance. Because on one hand, we hear a lot of Europeans saying, where are our European champions? And on the other hand, you're trying to uh, regulate all those champions that are out there. Um, and so if you over-regulate them, you might never get to the European champions. So Tyson, let me come over to you and ask you about if this seems a right characterization to you of the way Europeans are approaching this. But one of the issues about the regulation is that we're hearing a lot more discussion. We hear from Europe, we hear the phrase digital sovereignty or tech sovereignty. And some here in the United States look at this as, are Europeans not only regulating to protect themselves, but to protect themselves from the United States and from US companies. How do you see digital sovereignty? And is this something that companies, uh, non-EU companies should be worried about? I mean, I think there's a, a tension in how uh, different actors within Europe interpret the term digital sovereignty. And that has a lot to do with how they interpret the role of regulation, whether or not it is meant to be a, a non-tariff barrier to digital trade or digital mm -hmm. services, or it's meant to increase competition. And what I would say to the, the conversation that we've been having regulation versus innovation, I think that a lot of policymakers in Berlin and Brussels would say it's not that we are trying to uh, stifle innovation. On the contrary, we're trying to create a trustworthiness in the products and services that we're, we're delivering to the world and to our consumers. And they would point to some areas of high, high regulation, like pharmaceuticals, for example, um, where you know Europe is quite a leader. So they would say it's not, we want to have clearly defined rules that are adhered to an open market and a space that has competition. And what has developed in the platform space is as a result of network effects and blending across lines of services is that the, the market dominance of a few key actors has been anathema to the European approach to uh, market creation. So in their idea of a European single market, you know, you have to have competition. And that means data portability, that means being able to change users, that means transparency and algorithms, that means the Spider-Man doctrine of with great power comes great responsibility. Um, yes, Eva? Um, I just wanted to, yeah, briefly uh, give a, a, an example, and I think uh, Tyson managed to give a, a number of uh, reasons why regulation is, is sometimes uh, necessary. Uh, taking inspiration from the minister and the fintech sector, uh, Brussels has come up with excellent regulation for the fintech sector that is actually an exact example of regulation for innovation. It has helped the sector grow and prosper while giving legal certainty uh, for, for that sector. So indeed, sometimes you could provide certain and legal certainty uh, in order to for a sector to thrive. So let me ask the minister uh, about the idea of digital sovereignty. And as we start to think about a US-EU agenda, perhaps something that would be announced at the US-EU summit in June, um, what should Americans think when they hear the rhetoric of digital sovereignty? Should they just say, oh, it's, you know, Europe is trying to um, boost its own uh, stature, or is it something for us to be concerned about? 
I'll ask you to be brief because I want to do a lightning round with all of you after that. We're coming to the end. Minister. Well, I think first of all, uh, both Europeans and Americans, uh, we have to look for opportunities and more possibilities uh, rather than uh, threats and uh, and uh, and other ghosts uh, that may you know appear in the debate. And again, I'm I'm repeating myself a bit, but uh, us working together may change the global trend when it comes to setting global norms and standards. When it comes to uh, setting a certain regulation that accelerates and not stops um, uh, the innovation. Um, Eva briefly uh, told us about these champions that are already, you know, championing the process of innovation and, and basically change uh, the life we live. Uh, uh, but also we have to grow those champions and, uh, and let, them, uh, let them create. So investing into startup um, programs, sandboxes that, are, that were also mentioned here and um, uh, well education because uh, innovation begins in the field of education and I think that both uh, both continents uh, we have to work uh, on that in the first place. So uh, let me ask each of you now uh, we do have a US EU summit in June that's been announced. Um, we also have this proposal for a tech and trade council that is uh, that has been put on the table by the EU. We don't really have a forum where we talk specifically about tech and trade. So I'm going to ask each of you, starting with the minister and going in our initial thing, do you think this is the right thing? And does it cover enough? Is it good to link tech and trade? And if you could pick one issue, not privacy shield, I'm going to take uh, Tyson's argument off the table, but not privacy shield, which is being negotiated, what would it be? What, what's your key issue for this, Minister? Well, I think it's a great, it's a great, great platform, um, uh, the EU US Trade and Technology Council. And of course, there are so many things we could discuss uh, there. It's uh, artificial intelligence, additive manufacturing, cybersecurity. Uh, so uh, there are so many questions and so many very interested things we could uh, we could build on. Eva Medell. Um, thank you very much. I mean, I just basically want to see uh, this council to be a catalyst for these important conversations. Um, but it will also take, uh, I think, interest and goodwill from both sides to to make it work. So. Um, I personally would like to see that together we can set certain global standards and there is a different approach. Um, Europe approach is more privacy oriented. Uh, the US approach is more how do we compete in this globalized world and, 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 and you know, we succeed ahead uh, no matter what. And maybe if we can meet somewhere in the middle um, that would be important. And that's why I think these conversations are also uh, helping bridge, so to say, um, not necessarily the gap, but more like bridge our different views and find a, a, a common area where an, a common avenue and an alley that we could explore working together on. Um, it, it's a topic that will be way more dominant in our lives. So having tech oriented leaders, people that understand technology and what it could deliver for us, it will absolutely be key. Tyson, just right. one last sentence. Yeah, uh, market access. Let's do investment screening, export controls, import controls, research protection, and data flows. Let's create democratic autonomy. Let's make okay. trading tech the next coal and steel. So we're out of time. Thank you so much to all of you for this very interesting discussion. And I'm now going to turn everyone over to Leah and Ben in the studio. Thanks again.